The more questions I asked, the quieter they got. Uh -huh. So what I learned was that I could be open, like, hey, you know, whenever you need uh, a shoulder to cry on or, you know, somebody to listen to whatever, I'm there for you. And eventually, eventually, mm -hmm. they all came to me with their troubles or problems or whatever was going on, either asking for advice or just venting. Welcome to What I Meant to Say. I'm your host, Wendy Jones, founder of Be Better Media and a mom of four, passionate about human connection. Throughout my journey, I have experienced many What I Meant to Say moments. But since life doesn't give us do-overs, I've created a space to reflect and tell our stories again with a little more grace for ourselves and the hope that we can help others and be better for having listened. Welcome to What I Meant to Say. I'm Wendy Jones, and I'm here today with Ashley Clark and Cindy Clark. And, um, we're gonna have one of these amazing generational conversations that I love um, about parenting. And I know these two on very different levels, so we'll see where this goes, but I'm really excited because parenting is probably one of my favorite topics. So thank you guys for being here. Thank you for having me again, and thanks for getting my mom here to have her on too. Thank you for having me. Yeah, um, obviously Ash and I are really close and we've talked a lot about um, you know, female strength and, and parenting and her being the oldest of five. So that means you have a ton of parenting experience. <laughs> Would stand a reason. Yeah. Just a little bit. <laughs> You've got one up on me. So I, I didn't make it to five. I have four. And they're... Not a bad thing. No. No. It's, you know... Four's a lot. Four's a lot. Five's a lot. I always say three's the game changer. So... Totally. Would you agree? Absolutely. <laughs> My number three was like, what the heck just happened? Yeah. <laughs> Uh huh. Literally. Yeah. Literally. No. I but after that, that, number four was like, oh, okay, let's have one more. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I think we can dive right in and tell me a little bit about you know how your family got started and you know, what, how old were you when you had your kids, all that kind of stuff. Okay. So um, I was at the tail end of my uh, 19th year. So I was 19 years old wow. when I got pregnant with Ashley. So. Ashley was born, um, what is it, like 10 or 11 days shy of my 20th birthday. So we're about, we're 20 years apart. So it's kind of easy to remember like what her birthday is or how yeah. she is. It definitely <laughs> helps. <Yeah. laughs> all of them are, oh yeah, 20 years more. Yeah. Uh, and then um, every two years or so, another one came. And then, <laughs> um, so we had four girls. Wow. Uh, so at the age of 26, I had four, under six, six and under, and then um, and then we took a little break, and then four and a half years later, we had baby number five, which was a boy, so. Which that doesn't happen very often. I don't have the exact stats, but that is, that's a big, that does not happen. Tell her how. <laughs> so. There's a story there. Yeah, there's a story. So I really, um, I was really passionate about wanting a boy in my family, although I was totally okay if we tried the fifth time and had a girl. Um, but I had a friend who read a book called How to Choose the Sex of Your Baby. Okay. And when I read the book, I was a total textbook girl mom. Like, I could go back to each of my conception days. Yeah. Like everything, I could chart it out. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. Duly noted. <laughs> um, and then, um, but I, I was one of those lucky people who had a regular cycle. Yeah. And so I could count my ovulation days. I could count all of that stuff. And once I figured it out, um, charted my cycle for literally two years to find that day of ovulation. And voila, here wow. we are. Seriously, I like no joke. It's how. Yeah, it and this is all before the like. Now they have ovulation kits and nope. all that kind of stuff. No, like this I, was I remember old taking my temperature. And all that on stuff. The, yes, yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that. So yes. Yeah, and uh, the book gave their percentage was an eighty-five percent chance if you followed the guidelines and, and there's a few other like personal things right yeah. but but the idea was to catch it on the day of ovulation because the the egg and the sperm only meet they only have like a 24 yep. to 36 hour window of opportunity to meet at that perfect time so conception truly is a miracle true right yeah. but 
um, identifying when you could get pregnant with a girl or a boy is definitely that book is. And I am sorry I don't know the name of the book, but it that's I mean that's the name of the book. I do not know the author. I can't remember yeah. the doctor's name, but yeah. Oh, I'm sure we can find it. And mm-hmm. yeah, and and it's still a thing that people it, it people do this now and and. The, the science is the same. You can it's, actually, it does work. It does to, work. To a large degree. I mean. Yeah. I yeah. mean, you know, you're always going to have those outliers yeah. that it's like, oh, I did that. It didn't work for me. But. Yeah. But you got your boy. Firm believer. <laughs> okay. And, and at, when I was pregnant with my son, I actually contemplated the thought of having number six. Like, wow. I thought that was the road I was going on. And, um having a boy literally kicked my butt yeah yeah he i was exhausted not not only was i homeschooling my girls i had this new baby and he was just a boy like into everything like he could (laughs) as soon as he started walking he was climbing Mm -hmm. on the roof on ladders he had a climber and a runner and compared to four girls that I'm sure they were all different too, though. They were. Yeah. They were. My number. My number two was a, a tomboy. Like I, it resonated with me that if I never had a boy, she was gonna fill that, you know, <laughs> yeah, that spot because mm-hmm. she just was very athletic and you know didn't take no for an answer and just like one day I caught her trying to climb up the car door into outside the car into the car through the window. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay. Yeah. She's still climbing. She's gonna she's still climb the door jams. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And you have the ones that you don't have that you literally don't have to baby proof for and the other ones that actually like uh, are yeah. trying actively to kill themselves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. 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 It, in in to be honest, it's for me, you know, letting children explore and doing the climbing and gaining their <sighs> their muscle mass you know it's so important to let kids explore at that age and you know not just in a helicopter type of like hanging over them but you know I let my kids climb stairs I let them climb trees I let them do all that and and they don't have yeah your challenges with their you know muscle mass or or body you know learning how to do all that stuff out, yeah or even make mistakes there's a big there's the you're hitting on a big thing right now that i feel like is a generational change in parenting from the way you know we were absolutely raised um to make be able to make mistakes to do things that maybe you know where are where are those bumpers and those boundaries that we can put down for our kids but also not just hover over them right so what's what's your take and how did you handle that with your kids I felt that kids have to learn and explore with some sort of boundaries, but to be honest, if I worried about every little thing they did, I would be a nervous wreck. Completely. (laughs) I so concur with that. Yeah. And so, and and then I have this old school belief, sorry, uh, this old school belief that, um, well, if they do it and they get hurt hopefully they'll learn their lesson and not do it again. You know, yeah. hey, I've, I've given you the warning, the stove's hot. Yeah. Okay. You touch it and it's hot. Oh, too bad, so sad. In fact, I had one who liked to touch hot things. Like, I don't <laughs> understand. <laughs> but she would just continue. And I'm like, it's hot. I literally had to have burn cream in my first aid kit, the prescribed burn cream, because, oh yeah, you Who know, was I, that? Danielle. Oh, <laughs> she's feisty. <laughs> I like her. She's she a feisty one. Yeah, she, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> she, <laughs> makes sense. When when she was a toddler, I had a, a sewing room and I had my serger sitting out, and I walked in one day and she had all my knobs off of the serger. Yeah. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I love you, Danielle. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> it took me over 20 years to fix the darn thing. Like, I finally pulled it apart a few years ago. I, like, took all apart all the knobs, and I'm, like, trying to put it back together. And I got to work. But, yeah. Yeah. They'll all give you a different <laughs> run for your money. And I'm, I mean, and then their personalities are formed by the also the way that we interact with them. Right? So they come to you with a certain personality, and then we also... 
you know, we as parents, we don't have as much, I tend to think we don't have as much control as we think or we would like, but we do have a huge impact. Yes, I totally agree with you. I think one of the things that I learned along the way is that because they are individually so different, um, even though they're in the same family, their um, discipline has to be different. And I didn't learn that until after one, two had moved out and um, I had gotten through a rough spot with number three and then I got to number four and she was, why are you treating me like my sisters and I'm not gonna do the same things and and we had this conversation, a little heated, but at the same time I'm like, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Duly noted, you're n- not doing the same things, but I am putting that on her, transferring their her older sister's behavior mm-hmm. to think that she's going to act like that, and that's not the case. Yeah. And so when that was on the table, that relationship between her and I improved and the a better trust Um, I also learned that the more questions I asked, the quieter they got. Uh Uh-huh. So what I learned was that I could be open, like, hey, you know, whenever you need uh, a shoulder to cry on or, you know, somebody to listen to whatever, I'm there for you. And eventually, eventually, Mm -hmm. they all came to me with their troubles or problems or whatever was going on, either asking for advice or just venting. Um, What were the little things that you did instead of asking those questions to kind of, besides just saying like, I'm here, was there anything that you remember that you knew you were doing to kind of open that up? um, Specifically, I just stopped asking a bunch of questions. I let them, I, I yeah. let them open up and then, and before, before you start, there's one other thing I learned when she moved out, when, when Ashley moved out, it was, um, you know, she would call to vent and I remember this one conversation where I like went off like she was asking my advice and she's like, mom. I just called to vent. I didn't ask for your advice. And I'm like, oh, okay. So then um, in for future conversations, then I want you to preface this like, hey, I'm just venting. Or, you know, after I say my thing, you know, I'll, I'll want your advice or, you know, somewhere in between, right? Yeah. And then so I would ask, I'm like, okay, are you just venting? Or do you need me to comment? Like yeah. chopping yeah. up a bit, like ready yeah. to go. <laughs> please, please, ask for advice. Please, please. Ask for advice. <laughs> Not necessarily, but yeah. but almost, you know. But well, there's really... something as a parent, even if kids don't want it, and I think oftentimes that's the truth with any of us. I mean, could be parent to child or in a, any other kind of relationship where sometimes you just need to get it off your chest, right? Mm-hmm. But there's something in the, the fixer in all of us that's like, well, if I offer this advice, it's going to get better. And if it's for someone that you love, you really want to make things yeah. better. But yeah. advice doesn't always make it better. <laughs> so. I definitely got that from you. I do the same thing with my siblings or with anybody that comes to me. You know, I say I can be a good listener, but you have to tell me that that's my role before you start, because otherwise I'm ready to solve the problems or help talk you through those problems. Yeah. But I was going to say, mom used to be the question mas- master. Okay. Like, come out of out of the room for breakfast, and she's 20 questions in, like, what are you doing at school today? What time do I have to pick you up? I'm like, mom, it's volleyball practice. Uh-huh. Pick me up at 6, same as every other day. So it's so funny that that's something that you've learned as far as not asking as many questions, because that's something I distinctly remember, like, being like, gosh, I'm not ready to talk yet. I just woke up and came out of my bedroom. Like, give me 30 minutes and then I'll engage. (laughs) Yeah. My kids definitely, they know. Like, I I think there's a function of having five kids and trying to keep all of those details straight. For sure. That is, it makes you like kind of a hyper vigilant planner. And she keeps my details today. (laughs) 
And she's like, oh, you don't. I'm like, I literally did that, though, for 20 years with my kids. I know how to do it. My innate nature is not to be that way. But when you're running a house with four or five kids, like, if you don't, someone's getting left. Right? (laughs) I mean, or (laughs) someone's not fed. They get to their swimming. There's no food or whatever it is. And my kids still will say to this day, like, we were the four kid family, right? And I was always like, look for the kid, look for the two kid mom because she'll help you. (laughs) She'll help you. She knows what's going on before you do. She knows what's in that note that you haven't read yet. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Like I, I'm a big believer, like don't have too much pride. Ask questions and let them help you because the two kid moms always were way ahead of the game. <laughs> uh, so a couple things. I used to when when we left LA in two thousand three and got to uh, Bakersfield, and uh, the first day they were able to go out and meet people and play with, uh, I turned around in my house and I'm like, where are all my kids? Mm. Like I had no idea where any of them were, <laughs> and. I'm like, this isn't gonna, this is gonna work for me. So I got a big, I got a this big dry erase board. Okay. And I took the black tape and I lined it all up and I had everybody's name on there. I had in and out. I had the phone numbers. I had where, you know, like notes, like what house they're at or. Oh my gosh. Well, also, when we, moved, also <laughs> when we moved to Bakersfield, there were like three families right on our cul-de-sac. Yeah. So there, we weren't far. No, there were 20 kids in. That's so fun. Uh, and yeah, so for me, it was just like, hey, I need you guys to check in and out. Like, this is, I need to know where you are. You guys, it yeah. wasn't that like. <laughs> it's like their time card. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, it's one of them. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Because then you can just look at Check the board and you don't have to go to the room. So yeah. you can just be like, oh, she's out? Okay, I don't have to see. Yeah. She's in? Oh, where is she at? Oh, in her room maybe? Yeah, I like to keep track of meals. I'm like, who am I? Who do I have to provide for tonight, even at this stage? <laughs> like, are, am I just cooking for myself, for one, Relevant? or for all of yeah. you? Yeah. Because it makes a big difference. <laughs> it, does, it does make a big difference. And I think another thing was uh, my calendars were all color-coded. I had, like, highlighters everywhere and you know everybody's schedule everybody had different color the schedule is on you know I mean I have old calendars I could pull out you know and show everybody's schedule but it was a way I could make sure everybody got to where they needed to be and that kind of thing yeah so I'm kind of it's interesting to see like the so details and that feeling of control that we like to think we have right and delving into that idea that that we don't actually have as much control as we think. And not that being organized, I'm all over being organized, and these are pre-iPhone days, right? So everybody right. doesn't remember that either. Correct. Because I had written schedules for my kids pre-iPhone, yeah. and mine kind of transitioned in. My last was born in 2007, so, you know. It's, yeah, um, it's all electronic. Yeah, yeah so, yeah. well, and, the, you know, even my life changed that way because I used to have a planner that I would write everything out in. But... That idea that we will make ourselves crazy trying to control everything, like how how do you wrestle with that? Or what have you learned about that over the years? A comment that has resonated with me lately, not every situation <clears throat> deserves a reaction. Mm-hmm. Okay. One of the things that I'm working on right now because I how I am reactive like some issue and that's how I've been most of my life because I don't because I never allowed myself enough time for mishaps for plan a to change to plan d yeah literally in my life there I I left no extra time and so as I was raising children that consumed me for a while and now that my you know 2020 looking back you know it's always 2020 right right you can see clearly like where those hiccups were and you're like mm, god I wish I could have done that different or you know that kind so of do thing. you think it's like leaving space for something else to be okay that what you didn't like you had something envisioned you were trying to make something happen but something else like the things because I've noticed some of the biggest blessings in parenting are the hard things that happen. 
but that we didn't anticipate? I think now um, I'm looking for those signs, if you will, Mm -hmm. where before I would catch them every once in a while, but not really understand. Uh, So, yeah, I think that um, just not being so high, just being, you know, a perfectionist. I'm a firstborn. Yeah. Um, Three firstborns, right? Overachiever. You yeah. know, as a senior in high school, I was senior class president. I was editor of the yearbook. I played varsity sports, and I worked part-time. Like, my life has always been doing. Packed. Doing. Yeah. yeah. I'm, not, I'm not an idler. Mm-hmm. If I'm watching TV, I have a load of laundry or... Yeah, that I'm folding or yeah. organizing something like I I have a hard time just being oh. still. Have you dug into that at all? <laughs> like <laughs> as you've gotten older, have you gotten? Uh, no, she just adds more and different things to her plate. Not <laughs> yet. I got a big pile of spaghetti with meatballs, and every once in a while, the meatballs roll off, and yeah. I'm like, okay. And then as soon as all the meatballs are gone, I'm like, oh, I have time. Add another one. And all those meatballs get back yeah. on the plate. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. I I try really hard. So I my life is um, up and down all the time. Like so, I'll, I'll have be really packed, and then I'll come down, and I'll be like, oh, okay, now I have time. Oh, I have time to do this, and I have time to do that, okay. and I have time to do that, and then I'm like, oh, it's too much. Yep. I have time to do this. I have time to do that. yeah. So it's my I I'm working on still that. an exercise and. Mm. That's just conscious choices, though. Yeah. And that's the energy that it took to, if you say, you homeschooled them. Mm-hmm. For how many years? Ashley went into seventh grade the last quarter. So she was 12 and a half or so. So from almost. kindergarten to seventh grade. Mm-hmm. She, and we all went to school at that same time. So it wasn't like she waited for everyone to get to seventh grade. It mm-hmm. was like when I was in seventh grade, everybody went into school and correct me if I'm wrong, but it was a trial to see how we would how would we we would integrate, and we ended up liking it. So then we went back into public school the following year. Um, I don't think it was a trial. It really was. It was the decision. It was the decision. Um, there was a lot of um, dynamics with the relationship at that point, um, and I was working outside the home maybe a little bit more and. Um, I was just overwhelmed. I just couldn't do it. And I think the hardest thing for me was um, I felt like a failure. Mm-hmm. I felt like I failed at teaching my kids, which Mm-mm. people look at me and they're like, uh, no. Um, I, would have, I used to have like nightmares about being in charge of homeschooling my kids. Like they're, I, they're, I never. Could. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 my hat's off to you. That is a lot to keep track of. And, and that was back in the day. I mean, now there's so many homeschooling curriculums that are awesome. And there's a lot of homeschoolers out there. But I don't think the structure was there when you were doing it. To the, I mean, what, not as the way it is today. Yeah, it, there's definitely a lot more resources for that. I mean, definitely um, in today's society recommend that if you have the wherewithal and the finances and the time that homeschooling your kids is definitely... If I were to, if I were gonna yeah. have kids again, they I would definitely homeschool. I'd figure it out. Yeah, yeah. The public school system is a very interesting place in California. And even back right? then, you know, yeah. thirty five years ago, or thirty years ago, I was concerned with the environment and the school. Not that I didn't. Tr- well, yeah, no, I didn't trust the school system. <laughs> so I was gonna ask you what, the, and was that the, at the base of why you decided to homeschool them? I wanted to have control over their environment mm-hmm. and who they talked to and who they hung out with. So yeah, you know, and then I got criticized for their socialization and I'm like, they're in church groups, mm-hmm. they play outside sports, we go to the park, they make friends, they have friends on their street. Even did you feel even like to you had this day, an active social life when you were yeah. even to this day when I tell people that I was homeschooled until I was in seventh grade they go oh you're normal <laughs> because people associate homeschool with a lack of socialization yeah but yeah we were in church all the time church youth group church on Sunday all day like because my dad worked on the sound booth and mom was a greeter so we were there like 
8 a.m. Mm-hmm. all the way through, you know, and we had, there was a, a church family group of like four or five families that all homeschooled too. Mm-hmm. So we would take yeah. field trips together and things like that. So I never felt uh, a lack of socialization from yeah. that. I mean, my biggest uh, adjustment going to public school was that I had to wear real clothes instead of my pajamas around the house. Uh-huh. Like, I had no problem socializing. I jumped right in and I was ready to go. Um, they all did. They yeah. all did within. Because you were socializing while they were at home. All of the girls, so my son was younger, so he wasn't in school yet, but all of the girls within the first month and a half, or I guess the first two months, all got starred. Uh, star, star of the week, star of the week, whatever, or student whatever, star, student star. They all got it. All four of my girls, and I'm like, okay, I did, I yeah. did something you, right. You did, I, was say, that's, <laughs> I yeah. did something right, and then they, and then their grades were great. So you, they, they were on grade level and better. Yeah, we were it, outperforming. I remember in some, it, it, probably their weakest mm-hmm. one was science, but. Um, Casey, my number two, ended up becoming a science teacher. Yeah. Go figure. Yeah. You know, so they they find their niche. They find what they like. Um, I think our biggest challenge with Ashley was finding the, the sport that she wanted to play because she played soccer and then transitioned to volleyball. So um, played volleyball. So um, well, I feel like, I mean, the, the exposure to so many different kinds of sports is, I mean, and you ran track and you like yeah I played soccer and softball before volleyball but then when I started playing volleyball it was over yeah and then I played basketball a little bit in high school ran track in college but those were just kind of auxiliary like yeah I mean you in talk between. about being being overwhelmed and being an overachiever like I fell into that same thing mm-hmm. where I was you know getting straight A's I was in the clubs I was applying to go on these mission trips I was tutoring peers and friends um you know and I was a three sport athlete well two sport because it was volleyball and basketball and then there was spring volleyball but I also very quickly took that on Mm -hmm. and that's been something that I've had to unlearn yeah you know as I've matured and grown that's always fascinating to me are these generational patterns and the way that we you know we Learn from the older generation, but then also the you know, the younger generation as a way of teaching us too. Absolutely. But what are some of those things like in the process when you say unlearn? What are some of the positives of the things that that you you took from your mom, and then what are you unlearning? Um, well, I think one of the biggest things for my mom and what I've learned is like how to truly like be there for other people, and that you can do a lot as long as you're just like you plan appropriately and you have that but I quickly learned as an adult you know in my early to mid 20s that like almost all the things that I planned like quickly went out the window and so for me there was like some inherent like I don't want this feeling of planning everything and then it not going and then having to pivot or have a bad attitude or the whole plans are ruined because what you thought right what you your expectation versus reality Mm -hmm. wasn't right and so for me like I actually course corrected complete opposite to where even my siblings at some times would be frustrated as an adult like that I wasn't as much of a planner as I was before I'm like no no I can really go with the flow now like I have ideas of what I want to do but it doesn't need to be a b c d e it can be a f c Uh z And so that's like something I've even been trying to teach her is like, you know, as we talk about things that go on in our life, I said, mom, like, why are you getting so frustrated? Because the doctor took an extra 30 minutes and asked you the same question three times. Like, I understand that's inefficient and I understand that's frustrating, but is it worth ruining your whole day to have that frustration be Uh like in you? And so go ahead. So what's it feel like when she gives you that kind of advice? Uh... I'm, I receive it. I I receive anything that she says to me. Okay. Uh, I let it sit, resonate, and then move forward with it. It, it's really hard to have done something for so long Mm -hmm. and then now realize 
okay, maybe I was a little too intense. <laughs> there's a lot of intense. You mean you didn't have to yell at the McDonald's person because there's ketchup and mustard on the burger? Um, you I'm know, kidding. I'm... Got that. I, well, no, I mean, they... But a lot of them hold me accountable for my behavior when it comes to the expectations of paying for food and getting what I paid for. (laughs) You know, my expectation is that I've ordered something and that you all are making money to make my food and that it should be right. Yeah. Hmm. And I should have everything in the bag. And, you know, so um, that's a work in progress. Well, do you, do you, (laughs) what I've learned, I've learned a lot about our nervous systems, right? And the place that we are, where, where we're functioning from and what are the story that our body is telling us pretty much all the time Mm -hmm. in any given situation in parenting, it can be very heightened because we're trying to keep little ones alive Mm -hmm. to plan. I mean, there, there are (laughs) reasons it's a lot. And I lived in that a lot because I, my youngest was. He was a runner, and he, he did a lot of things that were not safe, and um, I was on all the time. And so coming down from that, I've, I've learned a lot about how to re-regulate, and then when you start to do that, how the world looks a little bit different. Does that resonate at all? Yeah, um, it, and just a little side note to that, I my son was like this close to having a leash on him everywhere we went, so I can relate <laughs> yeah, to that. Yeah. Um, and at some point, I thought he was one of, like, I thought he maybe had been borderline autistic or mm-hmm. Asperger's because we had some behavior problems. But his behavior problems were a direct result of his parents' relationship and the mm-hmm. everything that came after that. Okay. So, uh, so that wasn't, yeah, the issue. It was more of... Well, that goes back to that, that impact that we have on them, dying, right? Yeah. Okay, so you... When your youngest, how old was your youngest? And you've you've been through a divorce. Yes. Yeah. And how so? How old were these guys? When so the divorce was final in uh, two thousand seven. So the the two thousand six is when things really got ugly, so to speak. Um, and so James was eight, uh, n- seven seven or eight yeah he mm-hmm. was young and loved both of well they all loved both of us of course but, yeah. but he had a special like connection with his dad and so that whole separation and thing you know and was, that's where you were noticing a lot of the um, behaviors behavior problems yeah, yeah yeah um so I just with him specifically I would just be really transparent with the teachers and if we had a bad morning I'm like hey this is what happened this morning mm-hmm. you know go from there and most of his teachers were uh, pretty accommodating they really understood um, his fourth grade teacher fourth grade and fifth grade were really rough years and um, but after that um, I did get him involved with Boy Scouts Mm -hmm. because I wanted him to have an outside activity not just sports Um, yeah because he was playing baseball one year and he was having attitudes on the field and I'm like "Mm." I've been a coach all my kids have been athletes I am not going to be the parent who lets their kid stand in the middle of center field and have an attitude and bring the team down. Like, not going to happen. And I went to the coach, like, I'm so sorry I have to do this, but I'm going to pull him from the team because I don't think it's fair to the other players for his behavior to hold the whole team back. How did the coach react to that? Um, You know, to be honest, I don't remember. I think I was more worried about what I looked like with my kid on the field acting like an animal and not being able to reel that in and and be productive. And so um, that was a decision I made and whether good or bad, uh, you know, it it hindered him from playing ball in, in high school, which was really sad because he was He's a good athlete, uh-huh. like has the right body build mm-hmm. and really could pick up any sport and do well, just do well. And, uh, but I kept him, you know, ironically, you're like, you know, I, at that time I was like, oh, you know, do I want to do this? Do I not want to do this? Yeah. But putting him in Boy Scouts, he ended up 
becoming an Eagle Scout. Wow, that's not easy to do. And then he's now working as a district executive in Ohio yeah. <laughs> for the Boy Scouts of America. So I think I made the right choice. I think that was a decision. And, and really for him, the, the conversation, it was more about the conversation I had with him about his behavior. I'm like, mm, no, we're not going to act like that on the ball field. And until you can improve your attitude and be a part of the team, you're not playing ball. Two yeah. years, two years I did that. Didn't let him play. Yeah. So uh, how did his behavior over over the time, and really with all of them, making a divorce and making a decision to, to get divorced is a huge... It's, it's such it's a hard. struggle. It's so hard. It's hard. Um, what were your feelings at the time with what your kids were going through and how, how were you able to, you know, work, I think, work I think through that with them? Their dad and I were both hurting yeah. and we could not get on the same page. There were some things that we were on point with or we would have never got married, right? But there there was some some things that we just could not work through and... The divorce was a self-preservation. And I went to counseling mm-hmm. and a therapist, and I'm like, hey, I, I need to lay this out on the table and find out if my head is in the right place because I don't want this to be, I mean, it needs to be for me, but also needs to be for my kids. Mm-hmm. And we were at the point where we were literally arguing every day, like three to four hours, like no joke. Mm-hmm. Physically and mentally exhausting. Yeah. It just was not a good spot. And, um, and, you know, speaking of, gen- you know, that generational thing, mm-hmm. you know, I was, I had parents that were divorced. He had parents that were divorced. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, we came together as young adults and we're like, we don't want our kids to go through that. We <clears throat> had that conversation, mm-hmm. but we failed to communicate effectively with each other to get past those hurdles. The hard stuff, mm-hmm. yeah, and and it, it is what it is, yeah, right. Well, and there's a lot of maturity from 19 to how you know. Well, I you was, were married for how many years? We almost 20. Yeah, almost Same. 20 years. So I was 39 ish when yeah. when it all went down. And um, what was it? 39? Is that right? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. The year I went to college was when you guys sat us down and said you were going to split up, and then I think it was another year or two before the divorce was it, finalized. It was a year, but, yeah, yeah. What do you remember as being, like, really pivotal for you? Um, I remember them fighting all the time. I remember, um, like, hearing arguments from anywhere, like the house, the kitchen, or their room, the, um, the kitchen, um, and like what? How, do you remember what you, what your body and your mind felt like when you'd hear that? Um, no, no. But I remember the day that they sat us down um, and told all of us siblings that they were going to separate. And I just remember you guys telling us, and my feeling kind of being like, okay, I kind of saw this coming. But then also in that conversation, they started kind of bickering in front of us and I remember getting up and kind of being like we get it you don't need to argue anymore kind of deal and then like I walked out of the room I don't remember Mm -hmm. if it was angrily walked out or if I just walked out but I I remember it kind of being like okay like what's next but I was also getting ready to go to college Mm -hmm. so I left the house and I knew I knew most of what was going on but like the thing with like looking back now I can see both sides. I can see why they tried to stick it out for 20 years and why it took so long, but I can also see the liberation and how people started to get better, whether it was, you know, a year or longer for people to to find some sort of like grounding, right? Yeah. But for me, it was like I remember being at college and getting two sides to every story. Mm-hmm. And then having an understanding, a distinct understanding that neither of them were wrong, but neither of them were 100% right and truthful. Skewed, right? Mm-hmm. It's always going to be skewed. Right? So then me taking the middle road and saying like, okay, like I can see both sides and I feel where both of them are at. Like I'm very much like my mother. Yes. But I feel, <laughs> I feel emotions like my dad. Uh-huh. 
so I can see, and I knew that neither of them really meant to hurt the other, but yeah. the lack of communication was something that I knew inherently early. And that's like where my relationships and the importance that I put now, mm -hmm. communication is so important to me. And even if I have to say something and get it off my chest, that's gonna piss somebody off. Like, and I usually know when that's gonna happen, but I'll still say it. And I'll say it as nice as I can if I know it's going to elicit something negative back. But then people know where I'm at. Mm -hmm. And then we can either engage because you know where I'm at and you can want to. Or that's a sign that it's no longer going to be a fit. Yeah. Or that I shouldn't explore this relationship any longer because that communication piece isn't there. Yeah. So, like, whereas they weren't great examples in everything that they did in their marriage or their divorce... Like there were lessons that were learned out of it that I know that I do want to do or not want to do, right? And when you're questioning divorce like or staying together for the kids, like that's such a fine balance. But what she said as far as like thinking about herself but also the kids, mm -hmm. that was also very apparent too. I just wasn't in the house having to deal with, you know. Yes. And, and we've talked about this like – I can see a difference in the way that I've become as an adult being the only kid that had both parents in the household mm -hmm. till I left mm -hmm. versus the other four and different levels too mm -hmm. as I look back. So um, I think, yeah, just reiterating that communication is so important. And even then you can communicate what you need or what you don't need you know, or, hey, I, I need to take some time or whatever. And that person, like, if they truly love you and it's meant to be, like, they will give you that space. Mm -hmm. Right. If but they're in a place. But yeah. you need to communicate that. Yes. Right? Yeah. yeah. I think I think that's, that's huge. Um, well, divorce is one of the hardest things that you have to parent through. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's know, up there. And, and here's, here's my take on that. It, it, it takes a mature couple mm -hmm. okay despite their differences to not put their kids in the middle True. of the nonsense and that is literally the hardest thing to do um it's the hardest thing to do because i've i've said to them like you know they they didn't like me for a, a while mm -hmm. they they blamed it on me and they're um, you know, there were some things and I'm not saying I was completely, you know, like I contributed yeah. to the, the demise of the marriage. Like we both contributed to the demise, right? Whether it was lack of communication, whatever that was, right? But you have to, it just breaks my heart when I hear of people struggling in a divorce and these kids are being tugged back yeah. and forth because that they didn't ask for that no they didn't ask correct. for that right so i i just tried really hard and some days i was successful and other days i wasn't to not give them all of that information even though i tried to be honest with them yeah there's a fine line between being honest and i hear i've heard that actually my whole life in different different types of relationships and in, in observing my own family and observing other other families um, or even my blended family. Um, the, the concept that, oh, I don't want to hide anything from my kids, right? Mm -hmm. Or the concept of everything gets swept under the rug and nobody really knows, you know, the tough stuff that's going on. Mm -hmm. And trying to like to find that way down the middle because I don't want my kids worried about things they don't have to be worried about yeah. at this at a certain age. Exactly. They're not adults. They're not in the relationship as an adult. They're the kids. Yeah. So keeping them where they and allowing them to be the kids. And yes, they have to learn hard things, but there's that. And then there's also the, you know, for me, I have always said one of my regrets was making it look like making it look more perfect than it was and there is no perfect we all know that at this point right but it, I know mine came as a big shock to my kids because you hid because a lot of stuff there was, they didn't know yeah yeah and so I think there's a lot of lessons that can be learned and the more we talk about them in a way that is age appropriate and depending on what oh, the age of your kids are 
it's <laughs> it's a hard thing to learn because it has nothing to do with what we need. Mm-hmm. We have to go find what we need in, in a trusted friend, in a therapist, in a life coach. And you can find a lot of people that will help you sort out your stuff. Don't put it on your kids. Don't put it on your kids. Yeah. And I still, there are some days I struggle with that. Like I'll get a phone call <laughs> like just a couple weeks ago. She called me and I was having a day. And I just, I'm like, I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have gone off, you know? And she's like, oh, no, no, it's okay. You know, so now as an adult, well, yeah, it's different. You know, yeah. we, we can respect that. For you sure. Know, at well, times. different maturity, different skills. <laughs> you need to vent or let like, yeah. go of stuff or whatever. But, um, you know, we do. And, and I think that them knowing that it's not just, you know, having kids is hard. It's not a cakewalk. Like, it's a responsibility. Your yeah. life, as you knew it, is over. Completely. Like, there's no... Right? And yet, I will say it's the favorite job I've ever had. I wouldn't change I it for wouldn't anything. Change anything. Right? Yeah, I wouldn't, wouldn't change, change it for it. anything. No, because if I had changed anything in my it, up, up until now, I wouldn't be in the same place I am. And I like where I'm at. Yeah. So... So what are some of those <laughs> things? I mean, if you could put it from... How do you think you've changed over those, like, okay, she's 35 almost? Yeah. In July. Almost, almost 35. I mean, what, could you could you give that a couple of, of broad strokes? And, and if you like your life today, what do you think are a couple of the things you've learned? I think giving myself some grace, really. Um, I am a perfectionist and I'm going to try not to let the tears come through because I'm an emotional, you know, person too. But it's actually um, really good for you. Yeah. <laughs> I do. There's times yeah. where the closet is appropriate. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and then, uh, you know, then pull up the bootstraps and, and keep going. But uh, not going to lie, those days happen. Yeah. But, um, but really to just breathe. I think that I, uh, you know, I, Ashley's told you that I just finished my bachelor degree and I'm moving right into a master's program with um, with an internship. So at the end of July, I'm quitting my job and sticking it out for 12 months and just doing it. And um, so you're yeah. doing scary things. Doing scary things. Yeah. I think too. I don't know if you have these words, but I. And you can correct me, but I think one of the things I've seen her, and we kind of joked about this before she got here, like, you told me yesterday that you wanted to be a parent. That, like, that, like, you wanted to be a mom, right? So you, your life path was be a mom first, and now you're almost going back to Mm -hmm. what fulfills you and what you want to do. And it's taken you some time to figure out what that pursuit looks like. But, like, that's what I see you doing is now shifting your attention and your focus from your children and survival, right, financial and roof over the head survival to being able to decide what you want to do more often and do things for yourself. And that's why, like, when we have conversations now, we've been open for a long time Mm -hmm. in a lot of different situations and different conversations it probably started in college like when I left the house and I was calling for you know feedback or venting or whatever but that's what I see her doing now is going back to what she wants to find fulfillment in life and being that example that like well you can put what you want off for a certain time but then you want to go back to it because that something else was important at that time or more important than whatever your self wanted um so that's what i see i'm a firm believer that that things happen for a reason right yeah there you know so when i was 18 and i had started at el camino college was taking you know basic classes and i remember specifically a day where um, I was getting into my car, leaving El Camino, and I'm like, what am I doing with my life? You know, like, I really didn't know if college was where I wanted to be at that moment. Mm-hmm. And then not too much longer after that, I got pregnant. Mm-hmm. And um, and I didn't look back. Like, I didn't, I finished that semester out, and I think I had a couple withdrawals and, you know, whatever. And, and uh, I 
pulled, you know, I, I went into momhood like full steam ahead. Mm-hmm. Like did not even didn't look, back. look back. Didn't look back. Didn't regret a single thing. And and that's another thing. Like I've I'm a firm believer in live life with no regrets. You make decisions. Some are going to be good. Some are going to be bad. And hopefully you're learning from the bad times and making improvements. Mm-hmm. And uh, and hopefully you're enjoying those good times when they are there, yeah. because around the corner, there's always going to be something that happens. That, that yeah. could be bad, could be like, eh, but it's inevitable. It yeah. happens. So you have to remember that those good times are where you fill your cup back up, yeah. right? So you have enough energy to get through those other times. And, um, and for me, uh, I could have, I could have finished school, mm-hmm. but my focus was my kids. And my kids didn't choose to be born into this world. I brought them into this world. It was my responsibility to to bring them up, to be responsible contributing adults. And that was my focus. That was my complete focus. I worked part time in the evenings for most of their lives. And then um, when she graduated from high school, then I started thinking about what am I gonna do after my kids graduate? after I don't have any kids that's when she missed when she was and you know people are like oh aren't you going to be like so um sad when the kid you know what about the empty yeah, nest and I'm like people say that to me all the time now and I'm like yeah no I'm good yeah. I, I'm, <laughs> bye I'm, I'm good I'll spread your wings well like, after three yeah. years of raising children and like, you tr- and, and really the goal is to raise independent like you said independent contributing citizens and for for a time I was like did I do something wrong my girls don't want to stay in my house like literally <laughs> when they turned when they turned all 18, of us yeah 18 19 when they were done with high school they yeah. were all gone like don't let the door hit you on the <laughs> way up literally and I'm like I'm like oh my gosh did I do something wrong and and some of my friends like oh no yeah. no no you didn't and you know and then, still the kid at home. and then some of my friends like can't get their kids out of the house and I'm like well maybe I did something right you know (laughs) yeah well the world I mean there's a lot of factors that go into that but it's true I mean in the end like we do raise them to be contributing members of society and that doesn't happen when you all stay together now there's a lot that can come later like the relationship that you have now of course you know that what goes you know from good parenting and turns into more of a friendship but you know we're not we're not meant to be friends with our We kids. were not that, friends. Yeah. That's, and that's and that's the biggest point right there is that you aren't friends with your kids until and you know, when I talk to parents, anytime I talk to parents, they're like, Oh yeah, I have I have two girls and two boys, or I'm like, I'm just gonna start praying for you. Okay. <laughs> I said I said for a chain. I said Especially the girls. I, I don't know why there's such a difference between the boys and the girls, but especially the girls, they are turn into different people when they are teenagers. God love them. Yeah. You know, they, they are just different. But every single one of my girls, every single one of them, as soon as they went to college or moved out and either the one had a child or they did their college thing, it's like a complete 180. Yeah. Like, oh. Yeah. Oh, oh I recognize I you love again. You. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, okay, they're they're monsters for a little while. Yeah. And then they come back and then they're nice again. Whether it's hormones or or maybe oh, we're a lot alike yeah. and then you start you know <laughs> that was us. Yeah. Not yeah. yeah. this. So sometimes it's harder to communicate the more alike you are. Or, yeah. I but I think that Ashley and I have one of those different kinds of relationship that even if we have rubbed each other the wrong way, mm-hmm. we really internalize whatever that comment was or conversation and come out of it like, okay, well, well, maybe I need to think about this, you know, mm-hmm. and really give it a good thought. So, yeah. um, and it's a sometimes huge it's not easy. No. Sometimes it's not easy, but sometimes things need to be said, whether it's comfortable or uncomfortable. I believe that. Totally. Yeah, that's a big one. And sometimes you're ready to hear it, and sometimes you're not. So it might take somebody else to say it to you before you're really ready. Yeah. It's funny that 
sometimes when I give, when my sisters come to me and I give mm-hmm. them advice, usually they, they are calling me if they ask for it because they ask for it. But when she gets on the phone or then we, you know, cross our mm-hmm. I's and dot the T's, right? She, uh, she says the same thing. She says the same right. things. Like, so I'm basically just, I mean, my sister's boyfriends used to call me a mini Cindy. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm mini Cindy 2.0 because <laughs> I've learned how to not be as reactive way sooner than she has. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think that's why we butted heads for a long time because I was reactive like you and I didn't know what to do with, like, I wasn't ready to communicate or didn't have the capacity to communicate the way I needed to. So I just reacted or mirrored whatever I saw you do. Yeah. And so I remember that being part of, I think, our thing. And then once I left and there was, like, I remember telling her, like, I can't wait to get out of this house. I can do my own rule. Like, because, you know, you talk about how everyone's different. Like, I saw the rules get less and less strict with each kid. But then each kid, well, really, it was just number two. Uh be like pushing the limits even more and more like Mm -hmm. I had a curfew I had certain things I wasn't allowed to do and then lo and behold two years later they're doing the same stuff that I was asking permission to do yeah you're describing birth order beautifully right now (laughs) right and I'm like what what did I do like I don't I don't think it was that I I don't I don't think it was that big of a change I I think that there were but like I said earlier, everybody is yeah, no, different. No, there's and a lot that plays me, into that for sure. And it, and it took me to number three to figure out some stuff. So in my defense, you know, right? You didn't know, you didn't I, right? Have, no, yeah, and that's the that, capacity. Yeah, at that it's time. not. It's not. It's not. We're not making choices. We're not trying to make wrong choices, and nor are they even necessarily wrong choices. It's just a live and learn process. Yeah. But it does when you read those birth order books or you observe families. Oh, yeah. It's pretty spot on, and there's a lot of us firstborns that are very big rule followers, perfectionist type people type pleasers, A's, people yeah. pleasers, and I mean especially with with you know five kids, four siblings for you, mm-hmm. the oldest. We a lot of responsibility gets put on us, and yeah. or we, you know, and we, we we observe, and then we even just take it on without a parent even knowing that we're doing that. I remember distinctly one time she was like, well, "How can you always ask me to do it?" Yeah, and I'm like, "Because Same I'm asking thing you to do mine. it. I'm asking you to do it because I know it's going to get done right. That's why I'm asking you to do it." Yeah. It's like those memes that you're seeing on Instagram now. It's like, yay, I get to do more work because the boss knows I'm the only one that can do it. (laughs) It's that. Yeah. So, you know, you have to, but that's part of the the unlearning, the, as you like, and there's no blame or judgment on like how, from my perspective on how you guys parented, it's more just having the awareness now of you guys as humans not being where you even wanted to be or... Mm -hmm you know, the lack of communication or whatever, but that's just where you were at that point. And so me looking back and being able to observe it and be more aware, like I can look and I say like, I don't want, you know, I thought I was going to be married with three kids at freaking 26 years old. Yeah. And now that I'm not like, I, I know for a fact that I would be 10 times a better parent now than if I had those children. 10 years ago, Mm. which was going to be the goal, right? That was the goal that I set out at first. And then it quickly changed because I was like, I got other things going on and it's not in the cards right now. Yeah. But I'm, you know, and part of that growing was, you know, being a full-time nanny, as you know, Mm -hmm. and then making calls to her like, I'm so sorry that I never said thank you for dinner or Mm -hmm. asked like, what's for dinner instead of, you know, can I help with dinner or whatever? Yeah, because it's a huge place to grow into. Ooh, man, yeah. nannying two kids full time and the stuff that goes into that, you know, they weren't even mine, but starting to recognize the sacrifices or not just sacrifices, more the choices that the parents or even if they're going to go out of town, you have to coordinate all the stuff while you're out of town. Like and you hope that you have a trusted adult that can sleep with like in the house with the children yeah. and manage all these things. But 
not everybody can do it. Well, and if you have five, it, I mean, I used to publish them for four, but it's like a volume when yes. you go out of town. It's, right. I used to leave detailed <laughs> notes. Yeah. yeah. Or you'd have to split them up, and these two are over here, or mm-hmm. they're individually at friend's house, or, yeah. you know, depending on their sports activities or whatever that yeah. was. But, <laughs> like, we didn't get out that much. <laughs> it didn't happen that often. Yeah. No. Um, no, you guys, but, no, I don't remember you guys taking a lot of trips. If anything, it was family trips, like fam- family, we, yeah. summer camp um or traveling for christmas um stuff like that yeah oh man so there are a lot of places that i love to take these conversations but my favorite question to ask is um what is a piece of advice you would give to your younger self i would tell my younger self that i needed to be more patient Mm. and that Everything doesn't have to happen instantaneously. Yeah, I was a real big push. I think I forced a lot of situations because I was so um, domineering, you know. Um, it's that aspect of control. Yeah, yeah. I I, I really believe that, and so um, giving myself a little bit of grace to. To take a step back and look at things a little differently and be patient. Like I was trying to be patient this morning. And <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything active that you do differently now that helps you kind of cultivate that? Self-reflection. I do a lot of self-reflection. Like what, what could I have done different today? Um, how could I have talked differently to that person? What could, could I have allowed more time in my day for certain activities so that I wasn't either stressed or, you know, because I'm one of those double bookers. Yeah. Or, you know, multitaskers. I'm like, I'm like, ooh, I have five minutes here. I can add something. Oh gosh, that's stressing me out. <laughs> right? Yes. Like, this is what I had to, un- like, he talked about color coding your calendars and stuff. Like, that is my calendar. And I'm trying to be like, no, I don't need to fit something into this yeah. hour block I have. I can just sit oh, and I'm open famous up. for sitting in my car. My kids, I'm like, oh, I'm, I'll be in when I'm, give me 10 minutes just to sit in my car. <laughs> I learned that as a nanny too. Yeah. Sitting in that, that quiet time in the car, man, yeah. you never get that back. <laughs> you never get that back. Yeah. But, um, so, well, oh, would you want to, what? You've been on once. But, I have. It's but been a let's, while. Yeah. You want to give us, a, give me another answer for a piece of advice you'd give to your younger self. On, like, on this topic that we've talked about today, generational learning, parenting, things like that, I think the biggest thing looking back, I would say show and give verbal appreciation more often to the people that you know love you and take care of you. Like, that's something that's so important I think and people who are in those servant positions or in the positions where you're taking care of other people the appreciation goes a long way because you don't always get it Um, but for me specifically looking back now too I wished I would have been in a better emotional and mental headspace to stay connected to my siblings after I left for college Like I'm finding in my adult life, the relationship connections are what I've lacked because I went straight into work and I've had three to four jobs on a daily basis, working seven days a week, and then finding that I feel empty, even though like I have something to do all the time and people to see and talk to and help and all these things, but still not feeling fulfilled. So the advice that I would give is like, pay attention to the relationships, foster them, um, you know, and then show appreciation yeah. for people that take care of you and that you love. Can I piggyback on that for just sure. a second? Yeah, yeah. One of the things that I learned as each one of them left the house was that I failed to recognize the power that the oldest child leaving the house was going Im- to, how that was going to impact the younger kids. Yeah, that's big. And it really we don't think we're everybody's thinking that empty nest for the parents Mm -hmm. it's not about the parents 
it's about those younger kids and how they fit in the family now. Like that birth order changes when the oldest yeah. one moves out. And I think... And each consecutive one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I feel like I, I, my one regret was that I, I wish I would have fostered those relationships better than, you know, than I did. Because I think that had I helped them keep those relationships open, there wouldn't have been such a disconnect. But yeah. you're... As we matured and grew yeah. into adults. Yeah. You're so knee deep in, like, just survival. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, you forget. Like, that yeah. was one of the things they had to learn, to be friends as adults, not uh-huh. not children. That mm-hmm. Those relationships are advice. different. Yeah. That's great advice. And I can see how easily that happens, too. I mean, that's a really that's a really good hindsight. Um, yeah little wisdom yeah right that there. time you can't get back yeah for, for sure. sure um and the other thing I heard you guys say there um that well what it made me think of is parenting is it's 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 such a process of delayed gratification yeah. oh yes so for 100%. the people out there the when you're in the you're in the thick of it and it sounds so cliche and people say it goes so fast and you know and it doesn't feel like it's going fast when it they're doesn't. little and it doesn't feel like it go, it's going fast when they're fighting and it doesn't feel like it's going fast if you're going through a divorce but the thing is like if you can the more and more you can learn to be present that delayed gratification you start to get and I'm sure you've had some of these moments where you look around and go wow like it does nothing comes together perfectly Mm-mm. but it when it comes together it's the most rewarding thing really and going is. to your point of like relationships over any of the stuff that we do 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 we have to create well, that time and to give you an example this um, well there's been two in the last 18 months or so my mom came up to my dad's and his late wife's house in Williams Arizona and cooked a Thanksgiving meal for our family because that was the last Thanksgiving that she was here for my dad's late wife and then last Christmas so December 2023 or 2022 uh-huh. yeah. right what year are we yeah. in? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we all, my baby sister had bought a house. She bought a house in Anna, Texas. And my dad and my mom and my grandma and all of us siblings were there under one roof again. And it took a long time for us to get to that point. Yeah. But again, like I think that's just a prime example of how important those relationships are and modeling that just because we didn't work out in our marriage or just because we don't have the same political values or whatever parenting viewpoints, it's we're still family and as long as we're good people and we're not you know making the other person out to be the devil it's like we take our strengths with our weaknesses the good and the bad because we're family and you know and that's important yeah 100 percent. yeah there's no perfect family out there no every family has everything (laughs) that we're all dealing with it's just you know I've always said one of the things I've always said is we all have the we all have the same issues they're just packaged a little differently oh absolutely true and the more we talk about them Mm -hmm. the more human it feels and the less shame there is and that's the point of so many of these conversations because we're really all in the same boat we really are yeah Mm -hmm. well with that one I mean that's a pretty good way to wrap that all up because that's why I do these conversations I just think that there's so many things we do as humans that are so great and I think we highlighted a lot of those today yeah thank you for having me this was fun yeah absolutely thank you guys Um, thank you so much for joining us on what I meant to say Um, with Cindy Clark and Ashley Clark I'm Wendy Jones and I'm here to remind you just to be real be you and be better thank you for joining us on what I meant to say Another production of Inspired Edutainment, brought to you by Be Better Media.